thanks for joining us, Kevin. Uh, just thought it'd be good to catch up with you on your uh, time at the club so far. Um, first of all, like I've asked everyone so far, how are you keeping at the moment? Yeah, really well, thank you. Um, there's a, a couple of us that are having to keep uh, things ticking over at the academy, and so myself and, and Aaron Pugh have been uh, have been really quite busy. Um, I probably look forward to the weekends more now than uh, than I did when I was actually working, working. So um, all good. Um, trying to get out and keep fit, just in case I have to make a comeback at any point. And uh, yeah, and then listening as my wife homeschools three kids and just accepting that I'll risk divorce ahead of actually going and trying to uh, join in with her. So it's all uh, all interesting times. You joined Exeter as head of coaching back in September. Um, how are you enjoying the role so far? Yeah, loving it. Um, it's quite different to what I've done. I, I, I seem to have done a bit of everything in football now. Um, you know, played, managed, coached, scouted, um, and this is a really, really interesting role. It, you learn as much as you give in this role, particularly. Um, I've had to kind of come in and get to know. The thing about Exeter is because I've known so many of the coaches and so many of the people there. I know a lot of the guys without really knowing them. You know, like in football, it, it's such a small world. You know a lot of people to say hello to and, and ask how they are and how's the family, but you don't really know them. You don't really know them at a, a level where, in my job, I've got to try and help them and help them develop. Um, so I've spent quite a lot of time doing that, really, getting through the guys, trying to understand um, the, the Exeter, the Exeter City way within the academy. And, you know, again, when I was on the outside, you knew they were good, but you didn't really know why. And now I'm on the inside, I see that, and I've got to kind of get up to speed with it and understand it. But then also part of the reason that, that I was brought in was to bring some fresh ideas and, and a different um, a different look because of my background being away from the club. Um, you've taken over from a former teammate, Wayne Carlisle, as well, in the role. I guess that's some big boots to fill. That's pressure. That's real pressure. Yeah, Wayno is is outstanding at what he does. Um, he's very he, he's very intelligent, very intense, very hardworking, and um, and he's widely renowned throughout the kind of head of coaching circles of being uh, of one of the good ones, one of the ones that really bought in and really knew what he was doing. And the, the plus side is he's still there. So and because of that, he's got such an interest in development and such a passion to try and help people that. Um, you know, I've got him on tap when I need him to to pin him down and, and ask, you know, what the hell should I be doing here and, and how did you find that and what did you do when this happened? And and he's always really generous with his time and his advice. So, uh, you know, I've, I've always got on really well with Wayne. When we when we played together, we had a lot of the longer way trips and we used to spend quite a lot of time in, in healthy debate um, about football and about coaching and management because we both knew we wanted to go down that line. Um, I was always more on the first team side of things and he was more more on the development side and we've kind of switched paths a little bit at the moment, but he, he still has that passion to to help and to develop and to teach and so it's it's great having him there. I assume it's a very varied role, but what would the average day in the life of head of coaching look like? Uh, there is no such thing as an average day. I've learned that pretty early on. Um, you know, that... The, the bill and the end all, the, the main parts of it are about your relationships and your communication with people and, and trying to help the coaches um, become more mindful and maybe self-aware of, of what they're good at and what they can improve on and then giving them a few tips on it. And it's still, although it's nine months in, I, my battle has always been that I'm used to, nine months is a contract mm. as a, a League Two or a National League footballer. And so if you've not proved yourself in nine months, you could be out on your ear. And in this job, it's very much a case of taking your time to get to know everybody and know how it works before you start wading in with, you know, radical changes. Um, I've come in, like you say, taken over from Wayne, who's done an unbelievable job, along with Pewey and the guys in the academy, to, to get things where they are now, it would be arrogant and misled and daft of me to come in and think, right, here we go, let's do something that I want to do. It doesn't work like that. So um, I've come in and, and taken my time a little bit to get to know the guys and, and everything. But an average day, or as close to an average day, would be there's a lot of... Um, communication that goes on within the academy to make sure that the academy the first team the coaches chairman everybody involved are all on the same page the, the biggest strength i think i've seen is how um everybody works together everybody understands that 
the first team need the academy to do well, both for players and for potential finance for selling players. The academy needs the first team to do well, because if the first team are doing well, they're more likely to take the academy players in and, and blood them and give them a chance. Um, the chairman's obviously had this vision for many, many years of what the academy could be. So the, the biggest single thing I see at the football club is everybody works together, more so than I've ever seen anywhere else that I've been. Um, so I have to kind of be in on those communications and those meetings and those uh, discussions to make sure that we're all on that same page. Um, you'll then spend time. I, I do a lot of work with Chad Gribble and the under 18s because they're in every day. And so that's that's part of my job to, to be in and around them. Um, and then as the day goes on, you know, you do the, the stuff that I'm not so keen on, the paperwork and the, um, uh, the sitting behind a laptop, which I've never really done before. My computer skills are coming on in leaps and bounds because I'm terrible behind a, a laptop and I've got Pewey, Aaron Pugh has been brilliant welcoming me in and, and kind of um, nursing me along to, to help me understand how these things work. And then on an evening, I'll go out with the uh, with the age groups and work with those coaches and those players. But again, I've had to learn who the players are. I've had to learn the parents. I've had to learn the coaches. I've had to learn all these things. So actually, nine months really isn't a great deal of time in the job. And there's still a lot that I need to get a handle on. Absolutely. You played alongside uh, against Matt Taylor a few times in your career. Um, but did you have much relationship with him before you joined the club? Um, Matty was one of them that I knew. Yeah, I knew, I knew to talk to. I, I was friendly enough with. Um, you know, we've had obviously most of our career has been um, competitively against each other as players. Um, but he, he's always someone that's been that's been great with me. Um, I've been able to kind of strike up in a relationship when I've come in the door and, and chat with. Um, but again, it's with most people. You know, it's like. Julian Tag was really, really supportive of me when I was away from here. He was, he would always, you know, drop a message after a good win or drop a message after a defeat when I was at Torquay and just, you know, let me know that he's, he's seen it and that keep going and don't worry about it. Uh, Tiz, when Tiz was in, I always had a really good relationship with. And then when Matty was working with Tiz, I came in after I'd been sacked at Torquay and, and spent a bit of time working with those guys and seeing how they did things. Um, you know, I knew of Dan Green, I knew Pewey. I was I was doing some scouting, but I often joke about it with him, but before I got this job, I was scouting for Man City. So I used to come and watch some of the games in the academy. And when you're a scout, you get stuck in a corner. You're not allowed to speak to any of the parents. You're not, you have to stand where they tell you. So I'd come and see Pewey and he'd kind of give me my badge and then tell me that I had to go and sit in that corner and don't be seen doing anything else. And and now we work together on a daily basis and get on really well. So I just remind him of him that now and then that, uh, you know, he, he didn't used to be quite so nice to me. Uh, the academy has such a great reputation for um, producing, you know, these well-rounded players and players who've gone on to greater things. Just how good is the academy? It's excellent. I mean, it, 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 it has areas to improve. It has areas that it can continue to improve. Um, it's never the thing about football, you know, we talk about it a lot within the academy, but if you stand still, you're actually going backwards. So if you start thinking that you've cracked it, then you're done. Um, because there's always people that are trying to take the best players. There's always people that are trying to improve and become better than you. And so the, the one thing that I've noticed and that is, is spoken about a lot is this constant need and hunger to get better. Um, it's very good at what it does right now. It, it, the the structure within it, the common language that's used where, you know, the nine-year-old lads get talked to with a language that the 18-year-old lads will still understand. Um, so that continuity throughout the age group allows uh, the coaches to all be speaking the same language and having the same effect. But obviously each coach is different and will have different strengths and will give the kids uh, a different outlook and, and maybe hit different kids in a way that the, the other coach didn't because of their styles. So um, the balance is good, but it can always be better. And that's part of my job. And, and that's part of the excitement of being involved in it. It's also part of the pressure. You know, if you, if you come into an academy that's absolutely on its knees and not very good at what it's doing, there's not a great deal of pressure other than to get it up and running. And, and if you produce a player, then everybody thinks you're fantastic. I'm coming into an academy that's got a, a reputation and a history of continually producing players. So my my pressure as such is to keep the improvement and keep those players coming through so that 
that you know Matty's got the use of them in the first team as and when he, he needs them and the club might be able to sell a few on and, and, and make some money back so it's it is a very well run machine but it's never finished you know the the, the thing about the job and the academy in first team football it's always you know you start your week on a Monday you do a couple of days training you have your day off Tuesday's normally a physical day you have your Wednesday off Thursday you start looking at the, the real detail of what you're going to do at the weekend and who you're playing. Friday, you finish things off with a lighter session and then Saturday you play and you get your feedback on a Saturday because you played well and you won. You got three points. As a manager, you maybe didn't get sacked or, or whatever those things are as you go through. And then Sunday, you reset and you go again. In the academy, you don't know when a weekend is because you're constantly on the go. The games come at, at Saturdays and Sundays, so you don't have... Uh, a structured routine like I've been used to. Um, it's just an ongoing process all the time. And, and I think the big thing is making sure that you you understand that and then look at improving it and, and keep that those cogs going. Um, and what are the facilities like at the club as well? Um, a lot of players, when they join us, say, you know, how impressed they are at our level. Um, how do they compare to what you've been used to? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... Whenever it comes to facilities, it's always a relative term, you know, relative to the Premier League. It, it's, you know, if a Premier League player came down and trained at the Cliff Hill, then they would probably turn the nose up a little bit. Um, but from a League Two perspective, it's fantastic. Um, it, it's got really well looked after, really nice pitches. It's got the AstroTurf, which is a huge bonus and has been massive for us because obviously it's been a very, very wet winter so the eight teams trained on it pretty much daily the the games on the weekend for the youth teams have been on there um which has allowed matty and the first team to kind of uh, go between the, the grass pitches and, and still have good surfaces to play on again another example of working together i suppose as a first team in an academy um the buildings are, are, are decent enough but you know in an ideal world could be better there's a few leaks here and there it's not luxury but it's good and the, and I think I know from my experience at other clubs, it's very good because, you know, in the conference and at other League Two clubs, you, you'd be very lucky to have that kind of setup. So I can imagine when a player comes and signs and they, they walk out and the manager shows them around the training ground that they'd be really quite excited by what they're, they're coming into. Um, and as an academy player to walk in every day and see the big building, that I think it was Wayno's idea to get the graffiti put on the side with the pictures of the players that have been through and, and the, the must-haves, the ABCs, and, and, and that, that's got to be really quite an inspiring thing. You know, it's, a, it's always nice to turn up there, you know, in my job, never mind as a kid that's got it all in front of them. Um, has anything surprised you about your time at the club as well? Obviously, from the, you know, you had an uh, opinion of Exeter from the outside, but now you're inside. Has anything surprised you? Um, I'm not sure if I'd say surprised, but the, the, the thing I talked about earlier, you'd be amazed in football how poor the communication is at most football clubs um you know from the top it, there's a video that we showed to the kids on on their induction where you've got everybody from julian tag to matt taylor to coaches that were players in the system that have gone away and come back as coaches to pewey and brad miller talking about um you know what they do and how they do it um and that probably shows as well as i could explain just how well run and how tight knit everything is you know very few football clubs have a chairman who is so passionate about not just the first team but also the academy very few football clubs have members of staff that have played for the club gone through and done the hard yards in the academy and worked with everything from the under nines all the way through to the 18s and beyond um, a manager who has has been on that same journey played, coached, been in and around it and, and come back and managed. I mean, the the level of continuity and consistency within the place will show you why it's been successful. Um, the danger with that, obviously, is that you only ever get the same view. So you get that um, you've been in Exeter your whole life. That's all you know. You just know the Exeter way. So again, part of my kind of job and remit coming in was to look at it through a fresh set of eyes. And the balance for me is to understand how many good things there are and why they're good but also then well actually i think this might work and we could maybe try this however 
it's not just a case of me saying that i have to run it by everybody in the building we have to discuss it we have to bat around with it we have to see how it fits um but the beauty of the club is that they're willing to do that everybody's willing to listen everybody's willing to hear you out everyone's willing to try something without the fear of failure you know and that is evident with the first team and how they train and how the coaches i've never seen a set of coaches so detailed in their approach to planning executing and then reflecting on how it went that you know i i can guarantee you as a um, you should be very assured as an Exeter city fan that um matty and wayne and dan green they never just rock up to training do five aside and go home and chill out you know that they are in early they are planning they are evaluating how it went last time then they're going out and setting up before the players have even come in then they're executing their session and coming back in and talking about what went well and what didn't and football it's in its own little bubble a lot of the time managers are just set that they they turn up when they think they should turn up they throw on a bit of a five aside talk a little bit about who you might be playing at the weekend and then they go home and it's it's quite um a common occurrence in football so it's been really refreshing to see so much planning and depth and thought and reflection that goes into everything from the academy all the way through to the first team. With the current situation in football, um, did you expect the likes of the um, current uh, academy ones that are closest to the first team to really push on next season and be embedded more into the first team? I think, again, with the, with the COVID-19 stuff and the effect and the knock-on effect that that's going to have financially for every football club, I think to have an academy that might be able to produce you some players is going to be of a huge benefit, um, not just because they might be able to take a part in your squad, but also you know to attract the same quality of player who you've got to move down from up north, that you've got to get to relocate, that you've got to give enough money so that they can live. To be able to maybe produce those players is going to cost you a lot less in the long run. So it, it, it frees up a bit more budget that the manager will have to work with um, to go and get those players who he might see as his, his first team regulars and then the challenge then for your your academy boys is to to step in and and, and push the way in and, and become first team regulars themselves so i think that again that mixture is is really important but in the current state of football yeah the our kind of outlook at the moment is we've got boys you look at people like joel randall and jack sparks and um and, and Jordy dyer and one or two of those guys that are coming through from that kind of 18, 19, 20 age. And now you've seen it this year when they've stepped in, in in one of the cups and they've stepped in and found the ways into the squad themselves. They've done really, really well. Um, you know, Sparky particularly has come in and established himself. And then I, I what I saw towards uh, the end before the lockdown with, with people like Joel Randall was that they were really starting to stake a claim to be a regular squad player. Um, and with that, they're what, 19, 18, 19, 20? With what's happening right now, we're going to have to try and find a way to get players when they're 17 and 18 more capable of being able to to fight for a spot in that first team. And if we can do that, the academy will get better, the players will get better, the first team manager will have a bit less pressure on him because he knows he's got people he can rely on. And again, that's that, that everybody working together kind of uh, uh, mentality. Are there any players in the younger groups that we should look out for, or are you, should you not mention them for fear of them being poached? <laughs> the scouting network is such that most clubs will know all about them before they get anywhere near, um, you know, 16, 17, and 18. There's some good players, you know, there's some they're good players, but they're so young that anything could happen within reason, you know, the, the growth and what happens when they go through that, the. Um, the motivation it's quite a lot of pressure on a young lad in an academy there's a lot of training that goes on there's you know they're in four times a week um some players as good as what they are their mentality has to be spot on otherwise they'll blow up or they'll burn out or they'll find that it's it's not it's lost the spark it's lost the passion and, and to become a footballer you need that you need the spark you need the passion you need the the dedication to to want to come and do it every day and try and get better every day but I look at some of the kids in the academy and, and yeah, there's some real um, positives coming through. And again, it's our job to nurture that, make sure that um, we look after them both on and off the pitch and that um, 
in a few years from now, they are knocking on that door and, and, and looking at first team football. For a club like Exeter as well, with a you know a largest academy and so many players, is it is the loan system really important to us? You know, sending players out to local non-league clubs so they can be playing men's football at a younger age. Definitely, you know that's been proven. Um, you look at the guys that are in and around that first team now, and they've all been out and, and kind of earned their stripes, getting kicked by lower league players. Um, and and there's a strength to that. You know, there's a lot of good footballers out there that never made it anywhere near League Two. And and they're still playing their trade and they're still earning a few quid playing lower down. And for our kids to go in there at such young ages and then hold their own, there's, there's three of the boys been out at Tiverton this year. I know Will Dean got Player of the Year at, at Truro. Um, you know, that's testament to them to be able to go out at such a young age to such a good quality of football. But it's not just good quality, it's physical. It's it's nasty. You can play on pitches that you can barely pass the ball, and you've got to find a way to win. You've got to find a way to to be better than your opponent when he's maybe twenty eight, twenty nine at his peak. Physical. He's probably got a little bit of nous. He can drop a shoulder into you or give you a little nudge when you've not, you wouldn't have had that in the in the youth team because that's it's all fair and honest and clear and clean when you play uh, academy football and then you go and play for Truro and I guarantee. Will Dean's had to be a bit nasty at times and he's had to deal with a few bits and a, and a few things that are said and all those uh, all those bits that you don't necessarily think of when you're 14, 15, 16. So that, that loan system has been invaluable and the clubs, that, that the relationships with those clubs has been really important. And on the flip side, the clubs have got a lot from it. You know, to, to have your player of the year being one of your loan players from, from Exeter is obviously, it's worked out for you. You know, Tiverton were doing really well before the lockdown with three of our boys there and, and I'd seen them play there a couple of times and they were doing really, really well within it. So, um, Taunton, you know, all these guys that have been out this season have got something from it and it will stand them in good stead going into next season where they might be needed more at, uh, at Exeter's first team level. A nice story came out of the academy uh, this week as well with you, yourself and Aaron Pugh um, set the academy guys a fundraising challenge to cover a thousand kilometres uh, between them, and you raised an impressive two thousand pounds for the ICU at the RD and E, which I'm sure will be gratefully received at this time. Um, it's important that they they do things like this, isn't it? It's massive, and that that's really a big part of my outlook. Um, you know, myself and Pewy are kind of uh, talking every day about what we can do to get content out for the kids, and that's everything from sessions that we can do in a back garden through to the Zoom sessions we've been doing with them where we've had some social interaction and, and, a, and a bit of fun with quizzes and those kind of things. But we decided that this would be something good for them because it's it's giving back. It's doing something as a group, even though we're not together. It's for a really important cause because of everything that these, the key workers and the doctors and the nurses that are doing for us at this kind of you know, bizarre and, and unprecedented time. Um, and it's also a great lesson for those kids because some of them, with any luck, will go on and have really successful careers. And as as footballers, you're in a very privileged position that doesn't matter whether you're Ronaldo or Jack Sparks or anything in between. If you rock up and there's a group of kids or there's a charity to help or there's a, a cause that's close to your heart, you can have a big impact because you have a certain, I suppose, um, a certain awe about you being a footballer. It's a really privileged job and a really privileged position to be in and you can help in ways that you couldn't necessarily do if you weren't in that position. So I think to give them an early taste of that for everybody to have done it, you know, and this was the kids, the families, the coaches, everybody got involved, um, I think is a real good lesson for them to have and something that we should continue to do, not you know, not just in real times of need like this, but as we go forward. But it was uh, it was really um a real proud thing to have a look and see that we set a thousand pound target and, and we smashed that to pieces in about three days. And so um, really, really good. The guys at the ICU have been, have been really grateful and, uh, and yeah, we, we'll continue to try and do that kind of work. Aaron often mentions himself that as important it is to create, you know, good footballers, it's important that they're well-rounded young men as well. And I think if you look at Jack Sparks as an example, you know, he's done his own fundraising with his cycling and that and it just shows that they understand the community and how much they have to give back. Exactly. I mean, Exeter is a community club in, in every sense. And um, when you've got players doing like what Sparks has done to, to try and earn money and, and raise funds to, to go and give back, I think 
it should be a great sense of pride for everybody involved um you know from the community trust to the uh, the trust itself to the first team to the academy everybody is trying to give kids real hope that they could become exeter players uh, to try and help out within the community and around and about it and and that's a massive massive part for a football club you know it's there's bigger things than football but when you can bring things in like that and it can all be part of the experience i think uh, you're definitely on the right line uh, just moving on to your playing career now, um, you had quite a long career, making over 600 professional appearances, um, starting out at Sheffield Wednesday, joining Notts County in 2001. Would you say that's where your career sort of kicked off and did you enjoy that time? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, Notts County was, I had a brief spell at Northampton on non-contract terms when I left uh, Sheffield Wednesday and at that point it, I thought my life was falling apart and my career was crumbling because I'd been released and uh, at, at Sheffield and um, what next? And then I, I did well in my short time at Northampton, and, and that led to my my move and my contract at Notts County. And that that was my first experience of being. I said I was a first team regular, but I wasn't established. You know, I wasn't first name on the team sheet. Um, I had some really really good times. I had some really really good games, but I wasn't the forty game a season season pro that I became a little bit later on but it was my first example and experience of regular first team football and in league one it was a real good test and I loved it Notts County is a fantastic club great fan base you know I was living in the in the city I always like to live where I played I, I like to kind of throw myself into that and just be a part of it which has its ups and downs um, but yeah playing fairly regularly in league one i, I had a couple of particular standout moments that have, have stuck with me throughout my career, and um, and yeah, it was uh, it, it's just a great thing to do for a living. Uh, after Notts County, you spent some time at Scarborough and Forest Green in the conference before spending seven years at Torquay, probably your longest spell in your career, um, making 350 appearances for them. Do you look back at your time as a player there with pride? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think. Paul Buckle, who obviously was at Exeter as, as a player and a, and a coach, um, came in and he kind of, he was the best manager that I've worked for overall. Um, and he came in and he got together a group of guys that were kind of all pretty much near enough their peak. And then he surrounded us with young guys who were pushing. So he built a really well-balanced squad. And then it's someone like Chris Argreaves, who was towards the end of his career as the the old head who was the fittest man in the world anyway. So it wasn't like he couldn't run about. So it, you had an incredible balance of experience and youth pushing that experience. And um, it was an amazing first two or three years. You know, we, we were dominant for the most part. We, we got our promotion. Um, Books was then ruthless and, and kind of called the old guard as we got into League Two. And, you know, at the time you couldn't believe it when you look back. He was right. You know, some of us managed to stay on, hang in there and, and become established in League Two. And I was lucky enough to be one of those. But some didn't. And he was right to, to make those changes. But the way we played, you know, we weren't the prettiest team in the world, but we were effective. It suited my skill set down to the ground because, you know, my kind of superpower, I suppose, as a, as a player was I was all about set plays, long throws, corners, free kicks, delivery, um, crossing in open play. And we had players like Tim Sills, Chris Todd, another ex-Exeter player, Lee Phillips, Chris Zabrowski, um, guys that would throw themselves at anything you put in the box. So even my average crosses became goals. So I kind of developed a, a reputation as an assister. And, um, and I loved it. I, I, I absolutely loved being a part of it. So it was... You know, there were some hard times towards the end when things started to drop off and managers started to move on. And um, and eventually, like with most things, you, you get to that point where you, your time's up and uh, and you move on. And but I think in my experience in football, fans appreciate honesty, they appreciate authenticity and they appreciate hard work. And for all the things that I lacked, I would always give them <laughs> So with that in mind, I had a great relationship with that fan base and um, you know, and left on good terms, really. So it's um, it was a, a real good time in my playing career, definitely. 
Uh, we unfortunately, I have to take you back to May 2008 um, and those playoff matches. Yeah. Talking is, that the guy, is that the guy, there was someone on Twitter that I obviously asked a question, but his account was private and you said that'll be the first thing that I asked. It was about was it then? Yeah. Um, yeah. First leg at St. James Park, evenly balanced at one all coming towards the end and then Paul Jones hits a clearance and it hits Chris Zabrowski um, and he scores to make it 2-1. I mean, what are your memories at that point? You're probably thinking, you know, it's all positive at that point. Um, at the time, yes. On reflection, I hated that game. I hated that game. We played, we played four four two all season long, and I I was a left back, like, and and probably what would be classed now as an old school left back. You know, left backs and right backs nowadays are all about they're like wingers that basically play behind the wingers. I was a, a back things up, you know, the odd overlap, but really give it the winger, back him up. And if he can come out and let me cross it, then I was, I was feeling good about life. And, and on that day and in that game, Bucks decided to go 3-5-2. And I hate wing back. <laughs> hate it. And I was up against Wayne Carlisle. And Wayne Carlisle was, was fitter than me um, and probably a bit more mobile. And I spent the whole game tracking him and just running around with him. And for the most part, kept him quiet until he popped up and scored the equaliser and got inside of me, which I've spoken to him about uh, when I came. When I came into Exeter, when Tiz was manager, I had the pleasure of sitting and having lunch with those guys and they, they managed to have a chat with me about it there. It's amazing how often this gets brought up. But I personally felt like we went against what we were. I, I would have rather have gone there 4-4-2 and given it a lot and got beat than do what we did because it felt like we got battered in the game. We just scored early. Um, they equalised and then we, we scored late on because of a, a bit of a goalkeeping error. But it felt like we'd robbed it a bit. And it wasn't a dominant. We dominated teams that season. We'd smashed teams. We were like a lower league Newcastle of the 90s. It was if you score three, we'll score four. And, and there was a bit of a change Funnily enough, we got beat at St. James's Park 4-3 on Boxing Day. Um, Jamie Mackey tore us apart a little bit and, and that was a bit of a turning point. I did score in that game, I'll just <laughs> mention that. Um, but we were 4-1 down when I scored, so it didn't really uh, make a mark. But Books had a, a thing then where he called us in as defenders and basically said, if you can see any more goals, you're all gone. Because... Oh. There were too many games where they were exciting for fans. We had four threes. We had one week where we had a Tuesday night 5-4 and then a Saturday 5-2. And you're like, well, amazing to play in. But as a manager, that must be, you know, a, a double-edged sword. And I think he tried to tighten things up with a 3-5-2. And although we won, I don't feel like we really deserved it in that game. Um, and so it was a real mix. So at the time, I was buzzing. When I look back, I just feel... Not regret, because I don't think I regret anything. It is, it is what it is. But I do feel like we were fortunate to win that game 2-1. Uh, moving on to the second leg at Playmore. Pretty, I, thought, I thought you might. Yeah. I mean, pretty, to be honest, it was a pretty poor first hour of that game, wasn't it? And then, you know, Kevin Hill pops up and makes it 3-1. Um, how are you feeling at that point? You're probably eyes on Wembley, aren't they? That point, yeah. That, that was a different game. That That game, you know, we were comfortable to make it ugly you know we, we didn't set out that way we wanted to go out and score goals early on and really you know we knew if we kind of scored an early goal that you'd be up against it and um, when Hilly scored yeah I think we probably did feel like we were in real control because I don't think Exeter had caused as many problems um, we were feeling pretty good and always felt like we'd probably nick a goal on the break and then all hell broke loose um, Rob Edwards picks up the ball and uncharacteristically runs about 60 yards with it and, he, and then pulls it back to Ryan Harley who scores on 70 minutes and then sort of the mood changes then doesn't it yeah I think um, I think in, in a lot of times in football when it's last chance when when you've got nothing to lose I think when you, you're that you know you're two down with 20 minutes to go I think it's very much a case of nothing to lose and you know, it's easy now, certainly as a coach and somebody that's managed, I look at that goal and think, why didn't somebody just foul Rob Edwards on the halfway line as he set off and leave it there? But again, it hurts me to say it because it was one of the lowest points. It was the lowest game I've ever come off. You know, we were 
in that season, we were magnificent. It was one of the best all-round seasons I've ever had as a, an individual and as a group. And yet, 20 minutes at the end of a game completely crushes all of that, you know, all of that goodwill, all of that hard work. And it's classic football. You know, it happens. You can play brilliant for 89 minutes and still get beat. Um, uh, but when I look back, Exeter deserved it. I don't think that you could argue it. it they weren't lucky. There was no... Um, it, it was our fault. We had an opportunity to go in there and, and finish it off. We didn't take that opportunity. And Exeter, at the point where there was no return, stepped up their game and we couldn't live with it. And, and again, I, I think that they deserve that. And it's easy to say that now, looking back, because I went away for that summer thoroughly depressed and, and absolutely devastated. But... In retrospect, yeah, um, you know, I I look back at the goal where it, um, Wayne is up against me, and I'm kind of he, he had a real knack of he, he never went past you, but he would always cross the ball, and you'd find it really hard to stop because he would always put it out on an angle and whip it around you. So I went to cover that option, and he chopped back onto his left, but he also had a decent left foot. So he put a great left ball in. I think, was it Logan that scored the, the header? Um, mm. Which was basically final nail in the coffin. And again, that's, I should have stopped the cross. I should have got closer. I, you know, all those things that go through your head. But Exeter deserved it. So it was, it was the lowest single game moment, probably top three in my footballing career. But it was a great lesson and when you look back at it it was the making of us really as at, at Torquay because the next year we had a real chip on our shoulder and kind of bit between our teeth to go on and make sure that we put that right so we were better for it but wow it was painful and you know now I'm uh, now I'm in the building I've got plenty of people that get to remind me of that on a regular basis. I was going to mention that you got Dean Moxie, Matt Taylor, Wayne Carlisle all played in that game as well, I'm sure they've mentioned it. Watto, you got Watto in the uh, in the part-time coaches who scored the penalty. Um, he lives off that massively. So um, yeah, I mean, whenever we're having a bit of fun and a bit of banter, it's the kind of thing that comes up. I was on a, a Zoom call last week with Dean Moxie, and and he was asked a question about one of his favourite memories with Exeter, and it came up there. Um, so it should. If it was me, I'd be mentioning it. You know, if, if we'd have won it, I. I've always had a good relationship with all the people at Exeter and I've had a strangely good relationship with a lot of Exeter fans. I've had, you know, because of social media and, um, and the opportunity that that offers for people to get in touch with you, whether you want them to or not. Um, <laughs> I've had a lot of real good feedback and a lot of nice conversations with Exeter fans throughout my time at Torquay and beyond. Um, but yeah, if, if we'd have won that game 5-0, then I'd be having a laugh and rubbing it in Wayno's face and Matty's face every chance I got. But it's it's the beauty of football. You know, you, you, you learn, you get better, hopefully. You come together later on. It's a small world. I never thought in a million years I'd be working alongside Wayno and Matty and, and, and the guys that at Exeter and putting on the Exeter badge every day and, and really enjoying trying to give something back to this football club. So... It's it's a small world. It's fantastic, but yeah, I I've no problem with any Exeter fans coming and wanting to talk about that game because it it was part of what made me what I am now. You um you left Torquay after they suffered relegation from the Football League, um, but ended up rejoining as player manager in uh, 2015. Was that a hard decision to make, or did it just feel like the right thing to do? Um, it probably came a couple of years earlier. I, I always knew I was going into management. I, I at, at 28, I realised I was never going to become the player I wanted to be. I was never going to be good enough to play at the level I wanted to play. I, I strived for years. to. When I left Sheffield Wednesday as a championship player, I strived for years to get back to the championship. And, and it was on promotion to League Two that I kind of realised that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't quick enough, big enough, strong enough. But I found my level and I could continue to play for quite some time. One of my strengths was I was always available. Touch wood, I, I never got injured. Um, I was consistent and so on. So... I enjoyed that time from 28 to kind of 37, really, 38 when I retired. I mean, this job effectively retired me from playing. Um, but from 28, all I was thinking about there was becoming the best player I could be, but also with an eye on how I was going to be a good manager. Um, and so when the opportunity came up, it was probably a couple of years earlier than I expected. But it was a no-brainer to go and do it. 
despite the fact that obviously the club was in an absolute mess and there was a there was a huge amount to to try and achieve. And um, what's it like being a player manager? I mean, you just in your head you think how do those roles work together? I mean, how do you manage when you play and things like that? Um, yeah, it's not it's not easy. I mean. Uh, when I first went back, they needed experience. We had a lot of young players who were struggling massively and we needed experience in the team. So I had a really good left back there who I put in front of me effectively to do my running um, because he was ridiculously fit, very talented, really hardworking guy, a guy called Dan Butler. He's at Peterborough now. And um, he, um, he stepped up and, and played in front of me and it allowed me to be in a position where I could still see the game going on but just bring a little bit of calm to things. Having said that, it didn't go overly well um, to begin with. The Ironically, I was playing quite well as a player, but you can't really go home to the missus and tell her that you played quite well, but you lost when you're actually the manager as well. So um, what I found was that they needed experience. I was that experience and didn't have any money to bring in any other experience. We had a, a squad that was way too big and diluted it didn't have enough quality and there was a lot of players on very little money who were really struggling they were struggling to live and I was going in there talking about living like an athlete eating right sleeping right recovering doing all these things that you should do to become the best and they couldn't afford that they couldn't afford to go and eat uh, you know steak and chicken and, and veg they, they had to just get by with what they had so um it was a real task trying to get players out because not only were they on contracts, not earning enough money to really live, and in some cases not good enough, they were also tied to the club and nobody wants a player when they're at the bottom of a league. So it was really, really hard to move players on and it took me three months. It, it took me from kind of October when I went in to really the end of January, three or four months, to move players out and get players in that I really needed. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, I, at any other football club, in any other situation, I would have been sacked at Christmas. Mm. They just didn't have the money to sack me. They couldn't afford to. Um, they, the, the chairman at the time and the board were all fans who had given everything they could financially to just keep the club afloat. But they, they weren't wealthy in the sense of football wealthy, where they could just blow a million here and there and not worry about it. They'd given a lot and it, they're, you know, everything was on the line for them as well. So we had to sell players when we could. We had to move players on when we could. And we had to try and move things, players out, despite nobody wanting them. So it wasn't an easy process. Um, but when we finally got that done, um, I was given a very, very small amount of money at Christmas to, to make things happen. And it allowed me to pay off one of our high earners, which made kind of double that money. And then... Um, and then spend that money on players like uh, Nathan Blissett, Sean Harrod, uh, Danny Racky, um, uh, Iffy Allen, bless him. Uh, you know, we, had, we we got some. So Josh Reese came on a free from um, from Nottingham Forest on loan. So we managed to get some lads in who were the attitude and the um, the style of player that I really needed at that time. And so once we did that, I felt then was the time to drop myself. And when I did that, things absolutely started to fly. Now, I'd like to think that wasn't because I was holding the team back as a player. Um, but the fact is that when you're a player manager and you're on the pitch, anytime anything goes wrong, everybody turns to look at you. Well, what now? Then? And I was busy trying desperately to still be valuable as a player while looking at what was going on. So it was quite difficult then to say, well, we now need to do this, this and this. Um, when I took a step to the side and I was on the sidelines, they had that presence, you know, in the dugout that they knew was there and trying to help them. They stepped up as leaders because now I was off the pitch. So you have to sort it out yourself when it's on the pitch and it's happening at real time. So some of the guys that were a little bit subdued before really stepped forward. People like Angus McDonald, who was the captain, um, younger players like Nathan Smith, who's at Port Vale now, and, and Dan Butler, who went back to his favoured left back position and took great delight in showing me that I should have done that way earlier. Um, these guys really stepped up to the plate and they led and, and we were awesome. You know, we were that three month period from kind of February till the end of the season was exactly the mold in which I want my teams to play. It was high energy. It was honest. It was authentic. It was relentless. <laughs> they never allowed 
mistakes to bother them. They just kept on going and, and they were absolutely on it for in training, in games, just everything was exactly how I'd want it. And, uh, and we kind of went from 12 points adrift to, um, to staying up. And that was the highlight of, of my management career you know, so far, I suppose. And the problem with that is all those players that were on peanuts did so well that everybody came and signed them. So I, I lost what we'd, we'd built and I had to start again. And that, that 2 0 win, the final day of the season away at Bromley, would that be one of your proudest moments? And also, you know, where you had the most relief probably at that point after a very stressful six months? Yeah, it, well, it wasn't. It was, it was third to last game of the season. And mm. when we won, we didn't realise that we'd done it. Mm. We didn't realise that the other results meant that we were mathematically safe. So we kind of walked off the pitch fairly subdued and happy that we'd won. And obviously, but the big thing that we rammed into the players was when you've won, you've won, it's done. We're on to the next one. Mm. So, you know, we're, we're not in a position to go away and celebrate every game here. We need to get the points to stay up. So we kind of business-like walked off the pitch and right onto the next. And then someone came and told us that we, we'd done it. Got, uh, Steve Breed, who was the, the CEO at the time, came and said, look, you, you've done it. You're up. You, you, you're safe. And then obviously everyone went crazy and the hairs on the back of your neck and the relief and all the rest of it and the fan base going mental. Um, I mean, that was an amazing, amazing moment, amazing day, um, you know, and, and always will be. I, I, I love that um, that feeling of, accomplishment and for the players as well you know it, it saved careers you know if, we, if you'd have gone down from mm. um, from the national league into the national league south it's not just uh, the football club going down it's people losing jobs it's players maybe never getting to play at a level that they could have played it's it's so much more than just a relegation and um, to have had that and have that feeling was was incredible uh, the, your Wikipedia page calls you the Ranieri of the Riviera for that achievement. Has anyone actually ever called you that? Um, the guy that wrote it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I didn't realise until quite recently, actually, that, that uh, you, anyone can kind of change your Wikipedia page, can't they? Because I, I remember an Exeter fan must have changed Tim Sills's. He got, I think was it Danny Seaborn, he got sent off um, mm. by maybe overreacting to a little, a little nudge with the head and he went down like he'd been shot. Um, at St James's Park in one of those games, and um, I think somebody changed his. Uh, we, we <laughs> yeah, I can't really say what they put, but it was really quite amusing. Um, and yeah, I didn't realise that that was on my Wikipedia page. I, I, if I'm being honest, I've never looked at my Wikipedia page, so I, I don't know. Um, but a guy, a, a journalist, wrote a piece about our kind of rise and fall and rise again from when I came in to things getting really bad to actually then staying up and it was the season obviously that Leicester had mm. uh, won the Premier League so he kind of uh, referred to it like that but no I'm more than happy to be called that but I can't see it happening anytime soon. Um, following season uh, again you turned fortunes around and helped the club stay in the National League and with everything that was going on at the club I mean that must have been hard hard on you personally as well I guess. Yeah I mean that again very different season um, New owners coming in, a lot of cloak and dagger stuff, um, a lot of mistrust and um, misdirection. And it was a different experience. It was learning how to be, I suppose, learning about micro politics, learning about siege mentality, learning about um, how to function when things really aren't, you know, at the end of the season before, it almost became easy because it was exactly what I wanted. The players ran themselves. The, the, the training was exactly what you want it to be and, and intense and all of that was absolutely bang on. And then you lose a lot of those players because of they've done well and been moved on for money. And then you come back and I lost my captain. I managed to talk Angus McDonald into staying because I, I kind of said to him, look, you'll be a championship player. Just stick with me. He had a couple of bits of interest in league two and, and bottom end of league one. And I was like, look, you better just stick with us. And he did. And I was quite surprised <laughs> But he did. But then he got through pre-season. We had to sell him to Barnsley just before the season started. So there was a lot of stuff that went against us there. And it wasn't what I wanted it to be. I had to bite my tongue a lot that season and find a way of winning, even though um, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. And then with the stuff that went on off the pitch and the new owners coming in and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll probably write a book about that. I, I kept journals throughout my whole 
um, one of the directors when I first got the job at, at Torquay suggested I keep journals, like because you always look back, don't you, a year down the line and go, oh, I wonder what I was doing this time a year ago. And he said it would be really good to do that. And I, I took him up on it. So I've got journals that um, kind of documented everything that was going on. And some of it's a bit naughty. I'm pretty sure some of it, what they did to me was illegal. Um, however, we stayed up. We got the job done. And it was a great lesson in adversity, a great lesson in being successful, even though other people might not have seen it as a success because they didn't know the whole picture. Um, and that is football, you know, that nobody truly knows what a manager has or hasn't got to work with and, and the circumstances that they find themselves in. But because of the nature of it, you have to be diplomatic at times and you have to say things that, you know, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, you know, it's not, you're not lying, but you're probably not telling them everything because it's inappropriate to do so and, and tough because it might affect your job or others. So I did learn there how to you know, adapt and maybe not do things exactly how I'd wanted them to be done, but also finding a way. So when we stayed up at the end of that season, um, that again, it wasn't the same buzz as the year before because we'd come from nowhere and done it. But I had a real sense of pride that I, I and I say I, myself, my staff, my players, the people that were all involved with that, that we'd managed to find a way to stay up despite everything else going on around us so it was a again a proud moment but that was probably more relief than ecstasy as such like the last year was I mean you ended up leaving Torquay then early on in the next season after a difficult start um after all you've been through the last couple of seasons which that was one of your, the saddest and hardest times of your career definitely yeah I mean you know you move on of course you do and Torquay will always be a massive part of my life, my career and what I've done. I mean, I, I moved down here in 2007 with who was then my girlfriend. And since then, we're married. We've got three kids. I've had promotions. Um, I've been the player. I've been the manager. Like you said, 350 games, which I'm really proud of. It's always going to be a massive part of, of my history. Um, but you do move on. And, you know, it's... It's football. It's um, my relationship with the Torquay fans, I think, will always be there because I respect them and they respect me. And of course, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but you're never going to please everybody. I'm now on to that next phase. So when I left, it was sad. It was emotional. I felt like I'd been hard done to um, and, and wasn't given the opportunities that I thought I'd earned. But welcome to football. That's going to happen. It happens at every level. It happens whether you're a player or you're a manager or anything in between deal with it, get on with it. So it's up to you to, to dust yourself down and, and, and go again. And, and, and here I am. And, and this is, again, huge, huge learning experience for me. Um, really proud to kind of put the badge on every day and come to work as, a, as an Exeter employee. And um, we'll see what happens in the future. But yeah, sad time, sad to leave. Um, wanted to really show what I could do as a manager. But uh, life happened. Um, to go back to what you mentioned earlier, saying about having a good relationship with people on social media and something, um, you uh, got into a tyre flipping challenge with Torquay fan James Murphy, I believe, a couple of years back. I mean, how did that come about? Um, how did it actually start? One of the one of the things we used to do fitness wise, it was a bit of a finisher when you you'd done your workout and you'd done your your S and C work. It was a bit of a competitive finisher that we used to do at a gym called Winners 2000 down in Newton Abbott and uh, it was tyre flipping so it was a minute and you had to you had to kind of squat down and flip the tyre as quickly and as often as you could and a winner obviously was the guy that got the most and I'd had a competition the year before with one of the players um, and controversially beat him there is an argument that maybe I didn't count it properly <laughs> I, can, I can I can tell you if I didn't it was an honest mistake um, player called Will Hancock so I'm sure we'll mention that if he sees this um and this James Murphy's always been a bit of uh, a bit of fun he's he always pops up on Twitter with some kind of question I'm sure that you've had one on Twitter uh, about this um and he started giving it and I said well go on then put your money where your mouth is let's do one for charity and he, he took it on he was happy to go and do it so I I met him at a, at a gym. I was fair. I gave him um, a bit of training first. So I, I met him down at the gym and I took him through his paces and kind of 
showed him what it would be and gave him a, a, a trial run. And then we, we met on the day with another couple of Torquay fans who filmed it and we managed to raise a few hundred quid for charity, which again, I spoke about. I'm always big on that kind of stuff. Um, and we had a go. Now, if I'd have lost to him, I would have had to have left Devon, possibly the country, and never shown my face again because he, he was built like an eight-year-old. Um, and, and hopefully he sees this and understands that I still, I know that, but I had to destroy him. And, uh, and that's what happened. So the, the, the forfeit was to have to go and jump in a very cold uh, um, stream. And he took it like, you know, the half a man that he is. And, uh, and it, was, it was all good fun. But for a great cause, it was, it was good banter. He, he's a good guy. He actually, he's moved to Canada now. So he tries to stir the pot from a distance um, whenever he can now. But yeah, I think that's just, it probably shows the relationship I've had with fans in the past. It, it shows that if there's an opportunity to put yourself out there, even if you could look a bit daft and, and raise money for a cause that's bigger than yourself and everything else, then you go and do it. And, that, and that's what we did. And it was all good fun. Yes, the important question right now is, is, are you still active in tyre flipping or have you retired? I mean, should the city I, want to take you on? Would you take it? If there's an Exodus fan that, that feels like they've got it in the locker, then they, they, they know where I am. Um, I can definitely facilitate that when the lockdown is over, and uh, and yeah, we can we can raise some money for charity. If they challenge me to other things, I'm I'm confident in my tire flipping ability. There are other areas I'm not so strong at the moment. Myself and, and Aaron Pugh are, are giving ourselves weekly competitive challenges on the running front, and I've always been a terrible runner. Um, although I've only lost one of the challenges to him. So if he does see this, obviously he needs to up his game considerably. Um, but I am competitive and I am up for anything, especially if it can uh, benefit other people that might need it. Um, just going back to Exeter and Torquay, there's been some incredible matches over the years, but it's been about five or six seasons now since the two teams you know, played competitively. And it would be great to Torquay to be back in the league and you know these kind of games to go back on, wouldn't it? Yeah, again, I mean, we had that a couple of years where Exeter, Torquay and Plymouth were all in the same division. Um, and those games were incredible, you know, like the, the size of the, the crowd, the passion, the, the comments, all the stuff that goes with a, a big derby day. I mean, they were absolutely brilliant to play in, you know, even, even the ones that you lost, as much as it hurts that you lost, they are the kind of experiences that you want to be in. Um, and it would be amazing to get back to that. Um, however, it would also be nice to see this season get completed and exit to go up. And it'd be good for Plymouth to go up as well, so we could carry on that that fight. Um, you know, unfortunately, I was away with the uh, the under 18s when um, there was the derby game, the four 0 win at, uh, at St James's Park. So I, I missed out on that experience. But um, yeah, I think those kind of local derbies and those kind of um, occasions and those kind of fights and all the stuff that goes off with the fans and the players and it's what football is about. You know, that's what. That's what you enjoy, whether you're playing in it, watching it, managing it. It's brilliant. So yeah, it'd be it'd be great to have that competitiveness again. And you know, Gary Johnson at Torquay's done a fantastic job so far. And and when the season gets back on, hopefully next year, I'm sure that he'll want to have a go at it now that they've kind of re-established themselves in the national league. But um, yeah, I, I keep an eye out for the results, but my my focus is elsewhere. And personally, would you? Are you looking to take another crack in management later on? I mean, is it something in the back of your mind that you want to do again? Yeah, I think it is. You know, when, when I interviewed for this job, that was one of the, the, the questions asked. And, and I, I am always honest and always straight with people. And, and, and that's what I said to Julian Tagg and, and the, Rich Hodgson, the technical director. Is, yeah, it's, it's an itch that I have yet to fully scratch. I, I want, you know, I look at... Um, Matt Taylor at Exeter, the, the backing that he's got, the you know he's not flushed with money by any means, but the the infrastructure and the shared vision from top to bottom. I mean, he is an excellent young manager who's doing an excellent job, and he's got excellent people around him. And the opportunity to do something like that with a, a football club with that level of continuity and care for each other and, and, um, and like I say the shared vision is the biggest thing I don't think I could not have another crack at that 
if I can find it. And it's rare in football, so you have to accept that you might not get that exact as it is. But my biggest focus right now is to become the best head of coaching that I can be. Um, this isn't a short-term job. You know, my um, my life has always been one- and two-year contracts, so I'm used to things being quick and things to have to be done and have to prove yourself and have to win, otherwise you're gone. Um, this is a job that, you know, and again, you know, I go back to Wayne Carlisle. He made it really clear when I was considering whether I take the job or not um, what incredible job it is for learning. And the, the role of a manager and the type of manager is going to be very different for when I was doing it at Torquay to what it is now. It's different players. It's different generations. It's it's just a different game. And it will only get different because it will get quicker and, it, and uh, generations will change and things like this lockdown will affect what you've got to be and how you've got to do it. And, and so being in the job I'm in now, to become really good at it is going to take me a while. And... You know, I can give a lot to the coaches at the moment because of my experience and hopefully because of the person that I am and I can help them become better, but they're going to help me get better. And the people that I now kind of mix with and the courses that I have to do and the education that I'm doing is going to make me better. So I need to make sure that I max out this opportunity, help Exeter City as a, as a head of coaching, help the coaches within the academy and become really, really good at this rather than the you know the football thing is that people will use opportunities as stepping stones to to move on and do something that they really want yeah the answer is yes i do want to manage again but it's not going to be in the short term because i'm going to make sure that i'm very very good at this job first um and then when i feel like that time comes and you can't put a time on it because mm -hmm. things happen but when that time and that opportunity shows itself or well, then i feel like i would have repaid the trust shown in me to get this job in the first place and then I can go on and, and use those skills that I've learned and and go again but yeah it's a the competitive side of it is something that I will definitely have to have another go at. and uh, just finally we had a couple of people ask this on Twitter but um did you ever get close to signing for Exeter as a player was there ever any interest um no no is the answer I um I always got on well with Tiz um like i say when i when i left Torquay as a manager i came and um, um I, I came and spent a bit of time looking at how he did things and picking his brains and chatting with him and matty and wayne um but you you had woody and and the mm. fact is that woody is quite a similar player to what i was you know we're we're both of that generation where you weren't expected to bomb on and go past people but you were expected to have good delivery a good left foot, be able to feed the wingers and feed the strikers and um, and go from there. So the, the opportunity was never really there. It, 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 you know, I think Tiz rated me as a player to a degree, but he also knew what my weaknesses were. So he, uh, you know, he knew me as well as anybody um, as a player because he was down in this area and he saw plenty of me play. Um, but he had his own version of me. Um, and a couple, I think, have come in and tried to fight Woody for that place over the years, and he's he's managed to see them off. And I probably had a similar journey when I was at Torquay. I had plenty of players at left backs come in and try and kind of um, knock me out and get rid of me, and I managed to to hang in there and, and carry on doing it. So, no, I, I never had that opportunity. Um, uh, and yeah, I, at my only time, it seems that I'm only going to get to play on Exeter, uh, St James's Park, was either as a Torquay player or maybe in a charity game for the staff. Thanks for your time, Kevin. It's been really interesting and hopefully you can um, have an afternoon off today and enjoy the weather. I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. But yeah, that might mean hanging around with the kids. So maybe work would be easier. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Pleasure. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much. 